started. Um, Right. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for taking the time to attend this event today. Um, I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we are located and pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. My name is Mortaza and I am the training coordinator for the Australian Space Data Analysis Facility, also known as ASDAF. Uh, if you're not familiar with ASDAF, ASDAF has been established to assist Australian SMEs and researchers leverage space data, such as Earth observation data. We do this in three main ways. Uh, we help SMEs and researchers find and access uh, the data that they need for their projects. Uh, we can also help you develop uh, computationally efficient workflows and tools for processing large space data sets. We also provide training programs to improve, to help you understand how to use space data. For more information, please uh, visit our website on asdaf.space. We have a very exciting talk today. Um, please note that this event is being recorded. Um, if you have any questions from the, the speakers or from myself, please feel free to use the chat section and we'll go through the questions at the end. Our speaker today is Dr. Nicholas Yunus. Uh, Dr. Nicholas Yunus is a remote sensing and geospatial scientist at the Australian National University. He finished his PhD at the James Cook University in Queensland, where he used satellite images to explore the natural growth cycles of mangrove forests across Australia. Note, Nicholas stated that while current methods for detecting growth cycles work well on deciduous forests, they may not apply to man mangroves because mangroves are evergreen forests with one, two or even three growth cycles per year. Ni Nicholas proposed a new algorithm for detecting mangrove growth cycles. Nicholas's background is in environmental engineering. His skills have allowed him to work in various industries, including oil and gas, construction, engineering, consulting, and education. Before moving to Australia, Nicholas was a lecturer at the top university in Ecuador, a passion that he has continued to grow during his PhD, where he acted as a lecturer and a guest lecturer in subjects related to remote sensing and GIS. His current work involves measuring key leaf level flammability traits in eucalyptus forests and understanding how each trait is captured by terrestrial and space-borne sensors. He is also involved in the development of OSFUEL, a satellite sensor specifically designed to monitor eucalyptus forests and prevent the loss of lives and livelihoods to bushfires. Well, thank you so much, uh, Nicholas, uh, for, for your time today and for, for, uh, for presenting here at ASDAF. Um, over to you. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Mortaza, and welcome, everyone. I am in Nugawal country, so I also acknowledge the uh, traditional owners of the land where I am located. Uh, just a quick note. Uh, Today, in a couple of hours, we're going into lockdown, so I'm going to rush a little bit uh, through my presentation uh, just because I need to finish this and run home. I, I'm, I'm at my office. Um, but let's get started. Thank you again. I'm really excited to talk to you about uh, the work that I did for my PhD. Uh, I used satellites to model mangrove phenology, and as Mortas had just said, um, we are presenting a different approach to what people normally use. So this is what I'm going to talk about today, the importance of mangroves, a little bit about phenology, what do people measure, how the tides affect the way we measure phenology or mangroves in general, and then I'm going to go through uh, the process that we developed. So why mangroves? Um, as you know, mangroves are some of the most important ecosystems uh, worldwide in terms of carbon storage. They are known to store more carbon than many other tropical ecosystems, um, other forests. Uh, that includes uh, wet forests, for example, in the Amazon and throughout Africa. 
They provide goods and services worth millions of dollars every year, and they are crucial for our adaptation strategies against climate change. So mangroves are really important. Why do we use remote sensing? Well, satellites, especially Landsat, the Landsat family of satellites, has been collecting data for over 30 years around the world. So it's um, an excellent tool to monitor mangrove ecosystems. Another important uh, advantage of satellites is that they collect data uh, over space and time using the same method over and over and over. If you go to the field, um, then you might measure a different um, variable from what your uh, neighbor or from what other people are doing, but satellites don't do that. Satellites are very consistent over space and time. And lastly, because I was a student at a time, I wanted something that was very cheap and Landsat imagery was free, so win-win. Uh, but wait, I hear you say, uh, don't we have enough maps of mangrove ecosystems? And the answer to that question is yes. There are mangroves or, or there, are, there are maps of mangroves related to the extent, so where they are, how much biomass they can accumulate. There are maps of soil carbon in mangrove ecosystems. And there are even maps of canopy cover. And this on the lower right is an example from the national map of Australia. You can see the Townsville region and the different shades of green represent um, different canopy covers. But we can also use satellites to answer other questions. So do mangroves grow leaves throughout the year? Yes or no? Do mangroves defoliate? We know that some species do, but can we detect it this um, using satellites? And how do mangroves respond to the wet and the dry seasons? And interestingly, all these questions are related to phenology. But what is phenology? Well, phenology is related to periodical biological phenomena um, that, uh, that plants and animals have in response to climatic conditions. So let me give you an example. If you are a deciduous tree, you lose your leaves in the autumn and winter, and you regrow them as the temperature uh, becomes higher. But remember that phenology also refers to flower, to, to flowering, to breeding, and the interactions between plants and animals. So migrations, uh, birds, and other animals are often triggered by climatic events. So why is phenology important? In the case of mangrove ecosystems, phenology is related to carbon stocks. How much carbon do, does a plant use and how much carbon they store and how much do they release back to the atmosphere just as a respiration, for example, or when the um, trees lose their leaves. But phenology is also important because if there are changes in the phenology, these changes can have wider uh, responses uh, or consequences. Say, imagine that you are a pollinator in a mangrove ecosystem, so you can be a bat, and you're flying around trying to find your food, but the mangrove ecosystem has already flowered, already fruited, and you are late to the game. So if there's a change in phenology, you as a pollinator might be late, you cannot pollinate the mangroves, the mangroves don't grow, and therefore we as humans lose a good amount of goods and services. So phenology is quite important. Let me wrap this section up. And now we know that mangroves are really important. Yes. We don't need just another map of mangrove ecosystems. So I propose using satellites to monitor mangrove phenology. This is where the gap lies. Now, what do people measure? 
Um, this was one of the first thing that I wanted to explore. Uh, and you can see um, Karen Joyce's and Stefan Meyer's name up there. I, th I think that Stefan is uh, on this call. So a big, a big shout out to, to him. Um, we wanted to understand what people were using in terms of images, in terms of satellites. And we found out that on average, people use three images to monitor mangrove ecosystems worldwide. And these images are seven to 11 years apart. So there's a big gap between what people are using and uh, what they're doing. And few people at that point in time, few people had used more than 50 images. And why is this important? It's because if you only use two or three points in time to look at an ecosystem, it's very hard to measure phenology. If you capture the two, let me uh, try to highlight this. So if you have an image here, let me go back. The vertical arrows represent the observations, so the satellite images, and the red line represents the phenological cycles that we assume mangroves have. So if you have an observation here or here, then you can assume that the ecosystem is stable and that might, may or may not be correct. But what happens if your observations are at the bottom and at the top, then you might get the impression that the ecosystem is either increasing its foliage or in this case, the chlorophyll content or opposite um, what happens if you have an image at the top of the cycle and one at the bottom, then you might be under the impression that the ecosystem is being degraded when, when in fact that might not be the case. So the importance of how many images you use is really shown here. The more images you use, the better you can capture the, what's happening in the ecosystem. In this case, the phenology. Now, let me bring you up to the big picture. Until this point, we know that there are no maps of mangrove phenology just yet. So I thought to myself at that point in time, well, I should create a map of phenology. Excellent. After doing this, I wanted to know that we were in fact measuring only mangroves. And if, um, as I'm gonna show you a little bit later on, every pixel is affected by a little bit of water, a little bit of soil and a little bit of vegetation. So it's important to understand how the water affects what you are measuring. And why are we interested in the tidal heights? It's because that's something that we cannot control. We cannot control the tides. We cannot control when the satellite overpasses a mangrove ecosystem. Oh, I want to have a high tide or a really low tide. That's something that we do not control. So we need to take this into account. And as I said before, each pixel in an image is a mixture of vegetation, water, and soil. Um, so what did I do? I created an experiment where I created a very simple mangrove ecosystems uh, and where I could manipulate the tide. And this is roughly what it looks like. It's uh, imagine a big bucket of water with mangrove leaves uh, of different uh, numbers. And I use a hyperspectral scanner to simulate a satellite overpass. Um, and that this is the result. Uh, I'm only showing here uh, one stack of leaves. You can see that the uh, pixel size is quite fine. So we had very, very high resolution imagery. Now, I did a classification. What is mangrove and what is water? And then I calculated the fractional vegetation cover. That is how much vegetation I can find in a pixel or a group of pixels. And as you can see from the uh, picture in the right, there every pixel has a different amount of water and vegetation. 
once I had my classified image and once I had the vegetation cover, I compared the vegetation cover to the reflectance that I got from the scanner. So imagine that this is a satellite image. If we look at that pixel highlighted in red, we know that we know the vegetation cover of that pixel and we know its reflectance. And now we go to a different pixel. This one has a lower vegetation fraction and therefore a lower reflectance. And I did this for all the pixels in my images and imagine that this is what happens. But now let me ask you a question. Do you see a linear relationship? Or do you see a nonlinear relationship? So this is complicating things a little bit more. And so I did a bunch of analysis and I found that yes, NDVI in the lower left has a somewhat good relationship between what I found um, was the true vegetation fraction versus the predicted vegetation fraction. But I found that EVI is much better at predicting vegetation fraction. So there's a better relationship between the true vegetation fraction and the predicted one. And why is this important? Because we need a really good spectral index to measure um, vegetation. And we found that NDVI was actually not the best. We also found that at this particular scale, the tidal height was not uh, important which was good for me because I didn't have to correct, um, I didn't have to make any um, important corrections to the images in relation to the tidal height. Now, going back to the big picture, remember that there are no maps of mangrove phenology and I can now use EVI as a proxy for extracting vegetation from my images. And so I thought to myself, hey, I should create a map of mangrove phenology using EVI. EVI is good for vegetation. Now, um, let's move to detecting phenology using satellites. And at this point in time, I really thought that I was going to be the first one to have a, a map of mangrove phenology. But then this happened uh, in the middle of 2018, there was a publication in Remote Sensing of the Environment doing just that. And from that day onwards, this guy was known as my nemesis. So, Pastor Guzman uh, was my nemesis, and this is a very good representation of how I felt that day. Yeah, not nice, not pleasant when someone uh, beats you to what you're trying to do. But you know, uh, that's okay, I moved on. And so in this chapter, in this section of my PhD, I wanted to answer three questions. The first one, can we detect phenology using satellites? The second one, how does phenology, re how does satellite derived phenology relate to field phenology? And the third one is, can we use GAMS to detect phenology and GAMS are just a statistical analysis tool. To answer the first question, yes. So my nemesis beat me to it. And yes, we can detect phenology from satellite images. But upon further analysis, I found that people in my view were doing it backwards. Why backwards? Because they were a priori defining what phenology should look like, and then they fitted the data to the model. Let me show you what that looks like. So this is the nemesis way. This is the backwards way. First, people define the model. People say, okay, this is what phenology should look like. Then they put all the data, all the satellite images into that model, and they have a phenology. Now, my nemesis assumed that they already knew what phenology looked like. And if you have a sinusoidal curve in a sin, you predefine what phenology should look like. 
you're going to have a sinusoidal curve as an output. So sinusoidal curve in, sinusoidal curve out. And this might be okay for some applications, but I don't think that this is the most appropriate way. So let me show you my way. Let me show you how we did it. First, we gathered the data. That's all the satellite images. Then we let the data tell us what phenology looks like. And so we had a model. Now, importantly, we don't know what phenology looks like for every single pixel. And so we let every, the data on every pixel tell us what phenology should look like. And so we don't make any assumptions about the model. And we tested this approach using satellite images in a bunch of locations. You can see the map on the right. We had a location close to Darwin, um, two sites in northern Queensland, one site um, or a couple of sites in southern Queensland, and one site in New South Wales. In essence, let me show you what I did. I took a bunch of satellite images and for each pixel, that is each box uh, right there, we took 700 data points or close to 800 data points. And we created a model using GAMS. So generalized additive models are uh, a statistical tool that is non-parametric. This means that they do not assume what um, the model is, they adapt to the data. Let me show you what that looks like. The gray dots that you have that you have in your screen right now, imagine that those dots were EVI, EVI uh, from the satellite images. And imagine that the x-axis was time. So you could see how EVI changes over time and the GAM feeds a model through most of the data points. This is how GAMs work. Um, just a disclaimer, this uh, animation is just an animation from how GAMs work. It's not necessarily how, um, it, it's not necessarily applied to uh, EVI right now, but in essence, this is how it works. And after that, we compared our model from the satellite images to what people had collected in the field and we published data sets. So we had three different models, one from our satellite images, one from people in the field, and one from uh, published data. Now, this is what phenology looks like. In the x-axis, you see time. Every gray dot that you see is an EVI observation. That is an EVI value for each pixel in our study area. Does that make sense? So as you can see, the, there is variation through time in EVI observations. And let me bring your attention to panel B. So the one in the middle. In red, you see the phenology model, so from the GAMS. In the x-axis, you see time. And you can see how there is not a single point, there's not a single peak or a single trough in the phenology that we derive. And our model, still in panel B, has a good uh, correlation to the median observations that we collected from the satellite images. And let me draw your attention right now to the bottom panel. From the uh, satellite-derived phenology, we can start extracting the information or the phenological metrics as they're known. So all the peaks are the peak growing season. This is where mangroves are most green. And the valleys are the start of season or the end of season, however you want to see it. Uh, and that's where mangroves are the least green. 
Yeah, it's time to compare our satellite uh, phenology models to what people in the field were doing. Uh, and I compared the models with eight different variables that people measured in the field. And these, and these variables included how many new leaves were in the mangroves, how many leaves had been shedded by the mangroves, so how many leaves were lost in a period of time, the net leaf production, and a couple of other variables that people measured in the field. Now, in red, you're going to see the satellite model, and in gray, you're going to see the field data. Now, this is uh, a graph showing the seasonal variability, so January, February, March, April, May, and so on and so forth. And as you see, uh, the peaks in our model are well correlated to the peaks in the field data, and so are the troughs. But now you may ask me, okay, this is only a seasonal, how about the whole time series? Same thing, the peaks in the satellite model correspond to the peaks in the field data, and so do the troughs. So there is a good, a good correlation between field phenology and satellite phenology. This is good news because we can actually say we sort of know what's happening. Now, know, knowing that the two of them correlate well, I can create, therefore, model for other sites. And I found that satellite-derived phenology is best correlated to net leaf production across all sites. But I also found that each site has a distinct phenology curve. And let me show you what, I'm, what I mean by this. This is the phenology of mangroves in the Darwin Harbor. In the x-axis, you see the years, and in the y-axis, you see EVI values. The red line, again, represents the phenology model, and you can see that there are a few peaks throughout a growing season, and there are also a few troughs. If you compare to this to what my nemesis did, it's quite different. And the peaks represent just uh, periods where mangroves are greener, and the troughs where mangroves are not as green. And we can see that there is a cyclic variation, and this cyclic variation eventually can let us, um, can help us understand how climate change is affecting mangrove ecosystems. Now, let me bring you back to what I was saying about each site having its own phenology. This is what the phenology model looks like for every single site. And I'm going to give you a couple of seconds uh, to go through each one of those boxes. Now, pay attention to where the peaks are, where the troughs are. Now, um, it's important that we understand how these, uh, how each site varies, and there might be species variation there, there might be climate uh, events, for example, cyclones that uh, can affect um, the phenology that we detect, and so on and so forth. But the important thing is that we don't have a single sinusoidal curve for every single site. We can be very, very specific about what we're measuring, uh, and we can differentiate between sites. Now, in summary, yes, we can use GAMS to model mangrove phenology, which is a very big win. And Satellite phenology correlates well with net leaf production measured in the field. Let me again bring you back to the big picture. Remember that there are no maps of mangrove phenology yet, uh, and EVI is the preferred uh, spectral index. And now from, from this section of my project, I can conclude that yes, we can use EVI and GAMS to model mangrove phenology which is great. So I thought to myself, yeah, we can create a map of mangrove phenology across Australia. And um, 
because I've been I've been talking so much about my nemesis, I said, okay, can I compare my results to Mr. Nemesis results? And so I did. I I tried to to see how my results vary with different uh, sensors, with different areas, with different time frame. So I wanted to see how similar or how different were the the phenology results from using different sites. So this is my study area in the Darwin Harbor. Uh, in the panel in the middle, you can see a, a region highlighted in red. That is what I'm going to call a region. On the left, on the far right, you're going to see uh, the mangrove zone that I used. And there are three small boxes. Those are the plots that I used. And in conjunction, I tested, uh, I extracted the phenology in every single one of those. But I went even further than that. As you can see on the left hand side, I used the whole region, the zone, and a plot. And all of these are 100% mangrove um, areas. I, as I showed you before, there are different plots located in, in, in different patches. So the, the plot number one is the furthest inland. The plot number two is the one closer to the um, water line. And plot number three is right on the edge of the mangrove forest. I also use different spatial resolutions, so 10 meter pixels to simulate uh, sentinel data, 30 meter pixels uh, from Landsat, and I also resampled the data to 250 meters to simulate the best resolution that you can get from MODIS. I also used two years of data, four years of data, and six years of data. I use different frequencies of observation. So, as you know, Sentinel has a five year, a five day um, overpass frequency, whereas Landsat has between six days and 30 days. And because clouds are prevalent throughout the tropics, I wanted to understand how does the cloud affect the phenology that we can measure from the satellites. So, spoiler alert, phenology does change with every single change that you make. And you can see that some of those curves are similar to one another, but you can see that there are a few that are very, very different from the other ones. Let me briefly uh, show you what those are like. Now, remember that I had uh, a whole area that covers thousands of hectares. That's the uh, panel A. There's a zone that covers hundreds of hectares, so one order of magnitude less. And panel C is a plot, which is a three by two pixels uh, plot. In the lower panel, you can see that there are differences between the plot, the zone, and the region. So the scale, the area that you use to measure phenology impacts what you look at. Now also, between the three plots, so the location of where you take your uh, sample or where you take your training data, for example, also impacts what you're going to, your, your final product. So, Plot one, which is the one closest to the, um, the, the one furthest inland, has a slightly different phenology to the one that's closer to the sea. And these might be influenced by the amount of water in each pixel, or it might be influenced by the species, or it might be influenced by the amount of soil. So there are a few things that come into play in, into these differences. What about the pixel size? Can I compare my results to Mr. Nemesis? Um, I used, as you saw before, Landsat imagery, which is panel B. 
And my nemesis used Modis imagery, which is C. There's a very big difference between the two, not only in the pixel size in the upper panels, but also in the lower panels. You can see that the lines, the phenology that we detect from Modis is quite different to what we detect with Landsat or even Sentinel-2. Cloud cover, this is one of the most interesting ones. We, uh, to do this, we didn't uh, make any cloud corrections. We did atmospheric corrections to the data set, but we didn't remove the clouds. So you can see that the blue line has a very different phenology uh, or shows a different uh, phenology from the red line. So clouds do have an impact on the way we per uh, perceive phenology. And this is important not only for mangrove ecosystems, but pretty much for every uh, vegetation ecosystem throughout the, the tropics. So the Kimberley region, there are some times of the year where it's covered with clouds, but also the tropical forests in West Africa. So uh, Sierra Leone, Ivory Coast, it's very difficult to capture data on those regions because of the cloud cover. And if we keep going that way, the Amazon has periods of time where it's covered with clouds. So every single measurement we get from those places is going to be inevitably affected by clouds. And we know that cloud that even the best cloud masking algorithms still don't detect 100% of the clouds. So this is something that we need to take into account. Um, in summary, that was my PhD project. Um, very, very broadly, mangroves are very valuable ecosystems. They provide goods and services uh, to millions of people throughout the world. Phenology can be studied using satellite images. Yes, we can. And not all phenology is created equal. And this is, I think, the last of my slides. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Happy to get in touch. Um, sorry about the rush, uh, but you know, we're going into lockdown. Happy to answer any questions. So, let me stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, Nicholas. Um, it's always fascinating for me to, to learn how satellite images is used to, to solve very, very diverse problems. Um, so we do have a few questions um, in, in the chat section. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to just type it in the, in the chat section. Uh, we've got a question from David Kerr. Um, Nicholas, have you tried to gather your data using UAVs, drones? Um, sadly, I didn't have the chance, but that's something that I am exploring, yes. Um, the advantage of using drones would be the very, very high resolution imagery that we could gather. I guess one of the drawbacks is that we cannot necessarily measure um, leaf loss from drone imagery. I guess when you're ground truthing data, you want to use a different source of data. So if you try to validate your satellite image using another sort of remote sensing, in this case, UAVs, you're, so, you're sort of validating with the same type of data, but if it, it's a little bit more, uh, I guess, in my opinion, it's a little bit better to go to the field and actually look and measure the amount of leaves uh, that you're losing in, in the mangroves or measure the amount, quantify the amount of leaves that each mangrove is growing, even though it's a smaller patch, uh, but you really get a sense of what's really happening. Um, to answer your question, no, I didn't, I didn't get to do it, but uh, I did lay some um, time-lapse cameras and sadly I didn't have time to analyze them, but I have thousands of images of, um, of time-lapse images from, from mangroves. 
Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, we've got a question from Beck Gibson. So given issues with cloud, does radar or has radar or Sentinel-1 data been explored and does it hold any potential? Okay, excellent question. Excellent question, Beck. Um, I haven't used radar for mangrove ecosystems, but uh, people at NASA have used radar data sets to look at biomass and to look at the height of mangrove ecosystems. And I think from the analysis uh, that they did, they had some issues with backscatter. So that's still an issue that needs to be resolved or fully understood. Um, if you if you look at mangrove ecosystems, they uh, the roots are everywhere. They have aerial roots. The pneumatophores are everywhere. So that might contribute to the backscatter. And so it's a little bit different. I haven't used radar, but I think it has potential. It has a lot of potential. Yes. Okay, uh, we've got another question from Laura. Does the phenology vary from year to year and how did that affect your model? I, another excellent question. Thank you, Laura. Uh, yes, phenology does vary slightly from year to year. And that's something that we could find uh, using our method. I don't know if Mr. Nemesis uh, found uh, those slight variations, but I. Uh, let me share my screen again and try to go back to that particular slide. Um, and let me show you. Yes, we find, um, we can use this one. Uh, quite a few that are better. Uh, sorry to take this long. Yes. Um, if you look at our model catch captures year-to-year uh, -year variations, so those are these little gray um, circles. If you see them, they are, we can see variations from year to year in, in, in different sites. And we didn't explore what, if those were related to uh, climate conditions or soil conditions or the exact reason for what they um, meant. But this process or this method is really promising because you can capture um, these variations. So imagine that there's a hurricane or a cyclone or imagine if there is drought, you are able to capture those year-to-year -year differences uh, using GAMS. I don't know about the sinusoidal curve that Mr. Nemesis used, but with our model, yes, you can. Okay, fantastic. Um, I, I think we'll end, uh, so I've got a question um, and then I think we'll end the session then. Um, I am wondering how um, your GAM model compares to other non-parametric models such as random forest and, and, what, and, and why you chose GAMs over other uh, techniques? Um, really good question. So we use GAMS uh, because in, 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 our, in our brief comparison, it was one of the most uh, time effective and easier to use methods at that point in time. So I was using the Digital Earth Australia catalog, which uses uh, Python. And the easiest uh, Python package we found to use was a Python package developed by Facebook. So in essence, Facebook you um, helped me finish my PhD. But uh, to answer your question, you could use any non-parametric model and you can see what happens. I am sure that every model is going to give you a slightly different phenology and that's okay as long as you use the same method over and over again if you're consistent then that's okay uh, and that was the aim of my last chapter so can i compare my models to mr nemesis the answer is no uh, because the scale the resolution that they use was different to what i used 
And so I cannot say mine is better than his, or I can capture more information than his. Uh, we just did um, different things, essentially. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Nicholas. Uh, we've got um, uh, a few other questions in the chat section. I am going to take note of these um, questions and then I'll, hopefully I'll, I'll get in touch with you and then we can answer those on social media if that's okay. Um, yeah, that's well, thank you so much again, Nicholas, and thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. Before we end this session, I would like to inform everyone that expressions of interest for ASDAF support is open at the moment. So if you have a project that requires data access or specialized data analytics support, please uh, visit our website asdaf.space forward slash EOI to submit an expression of interest. If you have any other inquiries, please feel free to contact us through our website. Um, but um, thanks again. Um, and thank you for your time, Nicholas. Um, uh, see you guys in the next one. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye.